There is a place in the center of Hawaii Island that is a crossroads, a place where history is deep and found in misty mountaintops and the sounds of the winds. It's a place of heritage, a place of beauty. This is Waimea. Sheltered by the majestic Kohala Mountains, Waimea is a community that draws people to its beauty and feel. With a history steeped in tradition, Waimea is more than a pretty place. It's a place that grows and feeds those that live here. Waimea is Waimea because of its landscape, because of its people. I believe we are products of place and the people of Waimea, you see it in song, um, or poetically that they were noted to be the rosy cheek people because they come from the cold place. This word pleasant, olu olu, Waimea is a place of cold coolness which brings forth that word, olu olu, that it is pleasant. Much pleasure perhaps could be obtained by being in a place like Waimea, whether it is love or pleasure of beholding beautiful hillside views or that Mauna Awakea sits in front of us, so bold um, and humble. And then here's this, this very people element to it that we've been taught by dad and you hear it when he speaks. He'll refer to these hillsides of Waimea as the ladies. These ladies feed us. And on many levels, you could look into that. Then he always will refer to Mauna Kea, to Hualalai, to Mauna Loa, even to Kohala itself, the larger mountain, as the mamas. There is a kinship relation. Just as much as he would call to his mother and say, Mama, he calls these big mountains of, of our island, Mama. What I do know is hearing from a little girl, whether it was Kupuna Whitehead or Kupuna um, Mary Bell or Kupuna Mary Lindsay, these were the Kupuna in our classrooms when we were at Waimea School, that they would say that the waters of Waimea is red. If you look at the rivers and the streams of Waimea, it's red. There is a red tinge to it and that they attributed to the name, that that's why it's called Waimea. That, that I just retrieved from memory from those three Kupuna that were in our classrooms at Waimea School. Waimea has a long history that goes back centuries to a time when traditional agriculture was practiced throughout this part of the island. Waimea is part of Kohala, the district of Kohala or chieftain of Kohala. So Waimea, Kauai High, uh, what is Waikoloa today, almost up to Waipio, you know, up to Zimanakia, that the district is all called Kohala. It was a great agricultural uh, society here and they have these uh, terraces all along there and it ran through, through Waimea. We also had sweet uh, potato crops of Wala grain in the Kohala mountain lands between say the uh, Kohala mountain road and Makai of that. Uh, they ran uh, maybe 10 miles. The Hawaiians knew not only with rain but they knew how to capture dew in the mornings. So some of the, where the terraces are built will have low walls, very low, a few inches high. When the dew in the morning comes, and you see these, these terraces would capture the moisture and it would be, and it'll drip down into the, uh, into the crop, or into the uola. So it was a vast area. It was a great agricultural area. It supported many, many, many people. Uh, they also traded a lot. With what they didn't have, they traded. Beyond all doubt, the scientists, the archaeologists, the anthropologists, the historians are all very comfortable that by the year 750, not 1750, the native Hawaiian community was farming very, very intensively in this community. Why? For the same reason that the cattle industry chose to make Waimea its heart the privilege of having three streams meander 
through this area. The important contribution that the Native Hawaiian people made was the ability to apply irrigation that laced hundreds of acres of this area into very well-maintained waterways that in turn produced huge volumes of sweet potatoes, of taro, dry land, of bananas, and all of the other forms of vegetation. The presence of those same interlacing waterways exists today, and it's called the Waimea Field System. In this very community, there were seven or eight significant Hawaiian villages where people lived. We are sitting on the grounds of Pukalani Stables, the more than 100-year-old stallion station for Parker Ranch's finest breeding horses. Pukalani was an ancient Hawaiian village right where we are at today. And gradually, people did move, get closer to town. And same can be said right in town, that where the Catholic and Episcopal churches are at, uh, the name of that place is Ka Nakanaka. Uh, there's areas across the street within walking distance that's called Pu'uki. Uh, there's an area as you leave the edge of town toward Kwai Hai called Papua, which simply means pig pen. Not so, it was actually a village where they happened to have swine. Now we have to remember at the same time the native Hawaiians that came here, and had maybe been in the islands for 300 years prior to 750, brought with them the dog, the pig, and the chicken. And in this very same Waimea field system, you witness the fact that they already had pen space made to keep hogs in and later on to keep cattle out. This great society up here was, was very, very well developed. And when you look at the time when they were basically found in, in, in 1778 or around that time, most of the known world was known. So we were probably one of the last civilizations to say in, in the world as we know it came to discover. So we were, you know, Stone Age. With Captain Cook's discovery of Hawaii in 1778 came an influx of Western ways and new demands on the traditional way of life. A gift to Kamehameha the Great of six cattle by Captain George Vancouver in 1793 caused a significant change in the way of life in the islands. The cattle was, was, was introduced to the islands and then uh, allowed by uh, Kamem had agreed to, to wander and roam the island and, not, uh, and, you, and put a kapu on it. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't kill it, you couldn't do too much to it uh, without being punished. When you have feral animals, they'll live on anything. Wild cattle live on the bark of a tree and still reproduce because they have been so exposed to need that they survive. And unfortunately, they did beyond expectations given a taboo on butchering them. So when it got to a point where this very same Waimea field system could not be farmed for the fact that so many of these wild bulls and cows would plunder the gardens as they saw fit. Or if you walk from Pukalani village say to Pu'uki village, you took a chance of being chased down by a horned cow or steer or a bull because they had the run of the land. During this same time, disease and other outside influences took their toll on the traditional way of life, as many died or were put to work in the sandalwood trade. It took the people away from their agricultural way of life and understanding of that. The women or the men, young men that was taken away from their uala patches and uh, uh, taro patches and, and other uh, food items or whatever they were doing at the time, uh, they really didn't, was not very uh, accommodating to that. But the chiefs were the chiefs who they were. 
so they would kill the young plants uh, because they, they didn't want their children or to be succumbed to that form of, of uh, life. In 1809, as King Kamehameha is consolidating his control over the Hawaiian Islands, Massachusetts sailor John Palmer Parker, 19, jumps ship as maverick cattle dominate the countryside, wreaking havoc on family farms and gardens. Parker stayed to tend fish ponds for the king before going back to sea during the War of 1812. When he returned to Hawaii to live, the king gave Parker permission to shoot the wild cattle and supply meat and hides for local and foreign consumption. In less than a year, a thriving salt beef industry replaced sandalwood as the island's chief export. There are a couple of people that emerged and lasted as leaders in cattle apprehension. And that was John Palmer Parker and his cohort, and I say by that I mean they were colleagues, not cohorts, um, Jack Purdy. And they were both skilled at working cattle. John Palmer Parker the first was more of a businessman. Jack Purdy was more of a cowboy, more of an outside guy. He liked to, to rough house socially as well as, as uh, professionally. In 1816, Parker married Chiefess Kipikane, granddaughter to King Kamehameha I. They were awarded two acres of land on the slopes of Mauna Kea, where they built the homestead Hale Mana and had three children, John Palmer Parker II, Marianne, and Ebenezer. Thus began the foundation of what would grow into Parker Ranch. In 1819, Kamehameha I dies, and his son, Liho Liho, succeeds him as king. Liho Liho, along with Queen Kaahumanu and Queen Keopualani, abandoned the kapu system, which had been the rule of law in the islands for centuries. Many of the Heiauan temples are destroyed or burned. This huge societal shift is led by Heva Heva, the high priest of the kapu system under Kamehameha. This leads to dissension within the ruling families, with many of the holdouts coming from the Kohala Waimea area. There is a holdout in that time period, a relative of Liho Liho. Indeed, he is a holdout because he has been given the war god, Kuka Ilimoku, by Kamehameha I. And his name is Kekua Okalani. And he is married to a relative of mine. Her name is Manono. She has ties to Kohala, just as I do. They knew they could not possibly succeed in holding this, their kapu system. They could not save it, and they knew it. And how do we know that they knew that? Well, the chants, of course, tell us. E manu no la ea, e manu no la ea, ka u ka ope ope, ka ulu he la ea, ai, oi. That chant says, Manono, let us lie together one more time. Because in the morning, perhaps, it will be our last. So it is said that in this last battles, that many of the warriors came from right here, came from Hamakua, came from Kohala, came from Waimea. And when Kekua Okalani and Manono perished, in Kona, the warriors made their way back here to Waimea, to the stronghold. And they were found. And there were consequences of their standing for what they believed in. After putting down the opposition, Liho Liho consolidates power, ruling from Kailua Kona with Kaahumanu as his regent, and a new era begins. Six months after Kamehameha's death, the first Christian missionaries arrive in Kailua Kona. 
The year is 1820. Ten years later, after establishing missions throughout what are called the Sandwich Isles, a mission station is dedicated in Waimea at the site of what would become Imi Ola Church. In 1830, King Kamehameha III came to this area and uh, dedicated this, this spot where Imi Ola is to become a place of a gathering for worship. And in 1832, of course, an additional ship of missionaries coming, Dwight Baldwin came to this area and was assigned to take over ministry and mission work in Waimea. And also coming was uh, Reverend Lorenzo Lyons. Reverend Lyons was supposed to handle Waimea to Puoko to Honoka'a, which is a rather large area, uh, including Waipio. And so through all of this, it would take a circuit for him over the years of uh, six weeks. So although it's rather easy now, it was just extremely difficult. The terrain was rough. Sometimes there were trails and sometimes there weren't trails. Much of it was by foot. Lorenzo Lyons is one of the most beloved missionaries to come to the islands. Given the Hawaiian name Makua Laiana, he learned Hawaiian and Hawaiian ways and authored or translated hundreds of songs, including Hawaii Aloha. The, the documents show in his writing that, that by 1838, there was a baptism of 2,900 to 3,000 people in this area. I mean, that's, that's very phenomenal uh, because, you know, with the, with the disease hitting just earlier than that, the, the population dissipated. But for so many people to be touched through his word, and not just touched through his word, but through his heart. As the church grew in size, so did the population of Waimea, as people came from the surrounding countryside to attend church and live in the town. In those days, the plateau towards Mauna Kea was not pasture, but a magnificent forest that burnt in two great fires. Reverend Lyons, who did some of the first writing of observations of this community, used the phrase, ala ohiane, the fragrance of ohia here, meaning here. And that would be because of the verdant forests that extended all the way across this plateau and wrapped eastward around the mountain. The great fire that caused this area to be depleted and open like it is. There went the great stands of Koa and Ohia and Bamani. In 1838, King Kamehameha III brought Mexican vaqueros from California to teach Hawaiians how to manage wild herds of cattle. They became known as Paniolo, the name for Hawaiian cowboys used to this day. That was the mission of those men, to convert these people to cattle handlers, where those large groups of cattle would be gathered, they'd be separated, they would be branded, they would be neutered, they would be earmarked, and um, in a very short time, they converted that a foot man to a, a skilled mounted cowboy. After the Great Mahele of 1850, which allowed private land ownership, John Palmer Parker purchased 640 acres around Mana and another 1,000 acres in 1851. More land was leased and purchased from King Kamehameha III at a half cent per acre, and the ranch continued to grow. Over the next 20 to 30 years, the ranch would expand into one of the largest in the world but not without a tremendous amount of turmoil and tragedy. In 1855, Ebenezer would suddenly die, leaving four children behind. His son Samuel would be adopted by his brother, John Palmer Parker II, and grow up mostly on Oahu in high social circles. John Palmer Parker II would take over management of the ranch from his father, steering it through some of its most difficult years and upon John Sr.'s death, would share 50-50 ownership with Samuel. Samuel 
Parker, who is described as a playboy, a uh, community figure, especially on Oahu, in the highest social circles. Uh, he was a noble in Hawaii's court. And it was a struggle because he wanted to do a lot of things with his half of the ranch or the income that would come from it. Sam's vision for the ranch and extravagant lifestyle many times clashed with John Palmer Parker II's ideas and more conservative management style. This along with droughts, land disputes, poor quality cattle, and fencing issues saw the ranch come to the edge of bankruptcy and in 1887, the ranch moved into management by outside trustees. Tragedy continues to haunt the Parkers as Samuel's son, John Palmer Parker III, dies at 19 years old, and half ownership of the ranch is handed down to his 18-month-old daughter, Annie Thelma Parker. Annie Thelma Parker grows up, marries, and has her own son, Richard Smart, but she then passes away at only 20 years old when Richard is just an infant. Every single generation was met with severe human tragedy that by nature families fold up their cards and quit. And when you come down to Richard Smart, who was only about 18 months old when both parents were lost, as well as a, a sister, and the retention of one grandmother that saw the light to call for a fellow named A.W. Carter in Honolulu to come over and please try and gather up the loose ends of this huge inheritance. What did he leave? He was a judge. He was a um, trustee of Bishop Estate, the largest today and really in the world. He had a law practice. He was part owner of a railroad. He was part owner of a cane operation. He was the principal owner of Molokai Ranch. And he dropped everything and came here. Dropped everything. To come to an outfit by then, it was kind of in shambles. I mean, it, he, the people in the field knew how to take care, but he still got to have a leader. As A.W. Carter takes over leadership of the ranch, a new era begins as he starts dealing with foundational issues that have been at the heart of the ranch's problem. He had no background in cattle, you know, ranching, but he was very progressive. He had his priorities and he, he followed his priorities. The number one priority he had was water. You cannot raise cattle or even human beings without water. So he went to the state and got water uh, rights up into the, from the mountains up here, Kohala Mountains. And he, dis he distributed the water throughout the ranch. Then the number two priority he had was pasture management. He brought in a lot of good grasses and legumes. And number three was genetics. The cattle here was all wild cattle, or, you know, inbred cattle. He brought in registered Hereford cattle and he improved the herd here on the ranch. And Number four, he, had, he took care of his people. You know, he was a strong and hard guy, but he, if you uh, did the job right, he, he uh, uh, recognized you for it. Under A.W. Carter's leadership, the ranch came under one owner as he bought out Samuel Parker in 1906 after the Supreme Court validated Thelma's inheritance and ownership. The ranch started capitalizing on the Honolulu market, where in 1909, he started a meatpacking company with seven other ranches. They shipped the cattle out of Kauai High as they were loaded one by one from shore. As Richard Smart grew up in the San Francisco area, spending summers at the ranch, A.W. Carter continued to watch over and grow the ranch to over 300,000 acres, including sheep and goat, as well as a dairy. What had mostly been Hawaiian paniolo began to change to include other nationalities. Carter was very quick to recognize the fact that the natural ability to cowboy was present across the board. So then, as the community grew, the native Hawaiian cowboy had a parallel partner who was possibly born in Japan, if not his parents. Regardless of their ethnicity, 
or their upbringing or their household language. The native Hawaiian language was the language of choice, the language really of the industry of cowboy. Yutaka Kimura and his son Charlie are Japanese paniolo who grew up around the ranch and became foremen and ranch managers. Yutaka was recognized for his long contribution by local, national, and international sources, including the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah, he's my idol. I learned from him uh, because my other brothers didn't, weren't interested, but I was. And uh, after dinner, everybody walks off the table and just he and I sit down and talk about ranching, a basic uh, fundamental ranching. And that's where I got my background. Yeah, Pakarais was Waimea, you know. There, there weren't many cars in Waimea. Most of the cowboys rode horses all, all over town. Work, go to work, come home from work. And there, were, there was one cowboy, you know, he's a big Hawaiian guy, he rode horse all over town. And he has a big bull whip. And he see us kids walking on the road, he'll chase us with the bull whip and we gotta run and hide in the fence. <laughs> Another Paniolo who left us with a description of Waimea in the old days is Joseph Pacheco, who grew up in A.W. Carter's cottage from the age of 12. If you look at his picture, you think that he was a rough-neck, burly cowboy, but it, the fact is that he was a very soft-spoken Hawaiian man. Um, he was very eloquent, he was a people person, he wrote songs, he wrote poetry. He left behind, I'm going to read this, because this was his I Remember When. He also left me with other I Remember Whens, like he would always tell me that if there was snow on Mauna Kea between January and March, we wouldn't have to worry about drought situation in our town. And he would tell me that the old Hawaiians would sail into Anaiho'omalu Bay and they would walk a straight trail up to Lake Waiau to fashion their ads. But these are words that he had printed for us and left behind. In the old days, Waimea didn't have paved roads. We had cow and horse trails and some wagon roads. Most of the country was open space and we had very few fences. When we went out, we either rode on horseback or in a carriage. We didn't have radios, TVs, telephones or refrigerators. Parker Ranch had its own butcher shop, store, and restaurant. That was a big help to us. As the ranch grew, so did Waimea. As A.W. Carter began helping employees buy or build their own homes with no interest loans from the ranch. His generosity earned him the Hawaiian name Makua, translated to mean parent or father. Parker Ranch really was the community. They were one and the same. Almost everybody worked for the ranch, or had a relative that did. When they would have a Christmas party, it was for everybody. And presents were for everybody. The employees would get a weekly allotment of meat, as much as five pounds, of milk and of poi. P-O-I, poi. An employee got a big sack of poi once a week from Parker Ranch. In 1937, A.W. Carter retired and passed the reins to his son, Hartwell Carter, who had been groomed to take over. Together, they built the ranch into a phenomenal success story with over 500,000 acres and 30,000 head of cattle. They also returned over 20,000 acres to Hawaiian homelands and provided 60 head of cattle to the original 52 homesteaders. Waimeo was changing and as World War II unfolded, Parker Ranch leased land to the U.S. Marines and Camp Tawara was born. With over 50,000 Marines, Waimea grew into a city in no time and thrived because of the demand for beef, meat, and vegetables. There had to be a location between the rest of the Pacific to go ahead and house, rest, and recuperate and train Marines. Then the choice to go ahead and have it located in a community that had converted to typical truck farming, that hundreds of acres of cabbage and of lettuce and of carrots, turnips, 
parallel the daily preparation of probably anywhere from 12 to 20 fat cattle a day through the local slaughterhouse. So here you had a large focus of marine activity in a place in which there was almost an unlimited supply of food. All in all, why me to have a lot of farmers? I cannot tell you exactly how many we had, but we had a lot of farmers. And majority was Japanese, yeah. Why me, the elevation and the climate, whatever vegetable there is, we could grow it here. And the people was, Paco Ranch was very, very nice to us. In 1949, A.W. Carter died and Richard Smart started to take a greater role in the ranch, leading it through the next five decades. He had spent most of his life as an actor and performer in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. He downsized the ranch and in the 70s and 80s began to develop Waimea into a tourist center as new buildings started to replace the classic old ranch shopping center. The only remnant today is the hitching post outside Parker Ranch store where people tied up their horses when it was still legal to ride them in town. I remember when we would ride our horses through town and that was just something we all did. And in the early 1980s, we were galloping through the Waimea Park and we were stopped by the police officers and we were told that we could no longer gallop our horses through the park. And shortly after that, there was an explosion in population and cars. I think it was about the time Kohala Coast was booming, so there was a lot of traffic coming through town. And so it was no longer safe to ride our horses through town. Waimea today is a thriving city that is growing every year. Parker Ranch continues as a leader in the community, but is a much smaller entity with about 150,000 acres. The ranch headquarters is located in Richard Smart's house and holds memorabilia from the ranch's history and Smart's life as he traveled the world. He always felt that the ranch belonged to the people of Waimea and fulfilled that by turning it into a foundation trust with the beneficiaries being Parker School, Hawaii Preparatory Academy, Hawaii Community Foundation, and North Kohala Hawaii Community Hospital. Today, the ranch still holds events for the public, like their annual rodeo, which welcomes new participants of all ages every year. As Waimea moves into the future, new generations are learning Hawaiian ways and to take care of their place. As these young people go forward, it's important to learn from the past and pass down those traditions that make Waimea special. You have Hawaiian-speaking children now. You have Hawaiian immersion schools. And what will happen in the next 50 or 75 years as the build out of all of the different awards from the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is going to further preserve this as being a Hawaiian community. I am of this place, not of any other place. And I am surrounded by the stronghold that is my environment. I am surrounded by that which watches my back every day. I'm surrounded by this hillside that I know. I'm surrounded by a mountain and I breathe its breath every day. That is the Waimea that used to be that is the Waimea that is still here when we live it, when we teach it. Somehow, we have to save what we have left. Not just save, but we have to enhance that. We have to be better at it. We have to teach these students to love this Waimea like no other place. This place is special that this is sacred. We are sitting in sacredness. We are sacred. And if we do not take care of what is sacred, then what will we take care of? We sing 
at major gatherings and even at backyard parties. At the end of the night, we sing Hawaii Aloha. I think many people in Hawaii, even Hawaiians, don't even know it was written by a haole. And that haole was a missionary. And that he wrote these words, Hawaii Aloha e Hawaii e Kuone Hanaue. This is the place of my birth. And he's writing this for the Hawaiian people. These islands are of God. God created this place. We would learn, we would sing, always of peace, always of truth, always of love. And then, then he goes on to this next step. And in that he says, Olie, olie, inaupio. Now it is you, the youth, it is your time. It's just so fitting that we have Tutu and me here at Emiola Church, new generations coming up to maintain the values that have been laid through music, through love, through humility. He says, now, now it is your turn. Learn the values, gather all you can, the wisdom of the kupuna, the wisdom of those that have come before you. Now it is your turn to lift up your voice, share the beauty, the love, the glory, the forgiveness, and the joy of being in the Lord. <laughs>